is the Auckland to Fukuoka Yacht Race. This one says 1993, but we did uh, 1989. You did so, the first one. Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Lowell Shepherd of Pacific Solo. Welcome to my channel. If you're not familiar with it, I have a dream and a goal to cross the North Pacific Solo by the time I'm 70 through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. As an intermediate step, I'm cruising around Japan full time the last 14 months, gaining as much experience as I can, meeting interesting people along the way, and now actually being followed by the History Channel who are filming me for a series they're doing called Dare to Dream. I've been on land for the last 10 days because I had to go to Tokyo for some work with my Never Too Late Academy and to do the voiceover for the uh, episode coming up in July to be released first on Japan uh, History Channel and then at a wider markets later. Because I've been on land for 10 days, I have no sailing video to post. So I'm going to share with you a conversation I had recently with Yap Mulder about he and his wife, wife Maraikan, who at age 20 in Holland built a boat, sailed her uh, halfway around the world to New Zealand, then entered a yacht race to Japan, sailed back to New Zealand, then back to Japan, Southeast Asia, and now still live aboard here in Fukuoka, Japan. A storehouse of information, a great treasure, a delightful character, and so I'm gonna share my conversation with you at the Odo Yacht Harbor, where the yacht race ended in 1989. He came in second, last, he says. A great character, and he gives some tips for offshore sailing, so stay tuned to the end. And I just want to just say thank you again to my patrons who make these videos possible. Thank you. There he is. Hey, Mr. Pacific. I met up with Yap at his liveaboard boat, and then we went to Odo Yacht Harbor, which was the finish line for the Auckland to Fukuoka race that he participated in. This is uh, Odo Yacht Harbor uh, Clubhouse. How do you say your name? Yap. Yap Mulder. Yap Mulder. 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 Okay. It's, uh, same as uh, Fox Mulder from the x Files. I was born in Indonesia, um, which used to be part of Holland. And I grew up in, in, in Holland. And then um, my wife and I, we decided to start traveling and we moved down to New Zealand by boat. And I was 14, 15 years old. I bought myself the first dinghy. In, I took some lessons, but I mostly discovered sailing myself. And then um, later at high school and at college, I became an uh, instructor of sailing at uh, summer camps. And that's where I met Marijke, my okay. wife. And um, well, we, uh, we fell in love and kiss, kiss, kiss. And, uh, <laughs> and then um, I was still at college. And uh, when I, after I graduated, we decided to live together. and. We were talking about the future, what shall we do? Shall we start a family or shall we uh, start a business? And we both said, no, nah, no, thank you. And then we just said, said, well, why not build a boat and start cruising the world and yeah, let's do it. So, right. uh, so how old were you and when you made that decision? Um, to build a boat, I was uh, 20, 22. Right. Yeah. yeah. So well, we first bought a 25-foot um, a steel boat, which was half finished, and we finished it ourselves. And then uh, we knew that 25 was too small, and then we bought a 32-foot steel casco, which we uh, mostly uh, finished off ourselves. So the second boat was also not, not a finished boat? The second boat was definitely not a finished no. boat. It was steel. We have uh, everything was still in steel plates. Right. But we bought it as a. As it a was hull. A, yeah, yeah, as a hull, and we just did the painting and the, the interior. The, it took us uh, two winters. Yeah, because uh, we got the hull, and then uh, well, two seasons, well, two years basically. But uh, um, we had the hull uh, was stored in a in a shed very close to where we were living. So every evening and in the weekends it was uh <laughs> and then the, the first summer we uh, we had the boat floating we uh, already went across to england but the boat was built in 81 1981 right um and then we went to england in 83 okay. and we left holland in 84 why new zealand 
several reasons. One of the reasons my uh, elder sister lives in New Zealand. The other one was we knew more or less that we could find work in New Zealand. We're both medical and our papers were uh, recognized in New Zealand. And from Holland, from Europe, you can't go any further on the globe than sailing down to New Zealand. So uh, that's why we decided to uh, eventually end up in New Zealand. We left in, in 84, uh, in the summer of 84, and we arrived in uh, December 86, we were in, uh, in New Zealand. We had the coast of Europe, of course, uh, Gibraltar, um, across to um, Morocco, and then um, Canary Islands, Mauritania, Cape Verde, and then the, across the Atlantic Ocean. That took us uh, 20, 21 days or so, and then the Caribbean, we spent a long time in the Caribbean, right. and uh, Panama Canal. From Panama, we went to uh, mainland Ecuador, and then the Galapagos, um, and then across to the French Polynesia, and uh, Samoa, uh, Fiji, New Zealand. So this was like essentially four decades ago. Yeah. And this is before GPS for the yes. common man at yes. least. So yeah. what was it? So like? of, we were, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we used, of course, was the compass. Right. Uh, we had a, for speed indication, we had a trailing log. Uh, it was just a long line with a propeller on it that rotates and that tells roughly um, the speed you're doing. But there was a there was a nuisance because quite often there was uh, garbage in the right, in, in the log say, and, yeah. and, and fish would take the lure. And all that. <laughs> but uh, in the beginning we relied on it, and then um, we had a, a radio direction finder. Um, which is a, which works reasonably well if you're close to the area, but so it tells you where to home into and then right. uh, um, and sometimes we were using the airplanes right just follow the airplanes because they were going oh, to an island oh, wow, yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah but of course you use the sextant yes, yes. so um when we left uh holland we we were just doing coastal so that's uh, more tricky because of all the currents and the tides. Right. Um, but that, there was no sextant involved. But then we left uh, Falmouth from England to go across to Spain. And that was the first time we really needed to use the, right. the sextant to get the, the latitude. We didn't know exactly yet how to use it for to get the longitude. Right. Okay. But for the latitude, it's it's quite easy. Okay. Um, and if if you long keep on going from north to south you will hit Spain in one stage and that's, right. that's how we did. And later from Africa to the Canary Islands, we, uh, we figured out how to use the sextant to get the latitude and the longitude. Marijke had yeah. read the book. Okay, right. <laughs> and uh, together we figured out how to use it. And, uh, right. uh, and <laughs> sometimes we were not sure, but in those days you we had a VHF and there was big ships and we right. called the big ship. Hey, big ship, big ship, this is sailing Yacht Jan Haring. Can I check your position, please? Because <laughs> we didn't know where we were exactly. Oh. So it's nerve wracking. Yeah. Right. But we went through the Panama Canal and they, the, the, the fee for our boat to go through was something like 25 US dollars. I went through three times. Those days you had, go, had to have line handlers. Yes. So you would help other boats oh, and okay. they would help you. So, uh, so we go through our own boat and then take the train back to, uh, oh, and then to help the others. others. Just to yeah. yeah, help your yeah. friends, yeah. yeah okay. then, in those days, cruising was, uh, um, was good, was good, because we were all in the same boat. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, low budget. Right. Uh, everybody was um, sharing the books and sharing yeah. the charts and the information. Yeah. And, uh, my sister, she built a boat in New Zealand and with the idea of cruising the, the South Pacific and then um, in those days correspondence was by post restaurants from the post office so we would write a letter right. and then would they receive it would they send us where they would be and then we were at a, uh, we were supposed to go to Rarotonga but because of bad weather and the 
trouble with navigation, with using the sextant, we decided to, to play safe and we ended up in uh, uh, Samoa, in Pango Pango, right. Western Samoa. And then uh, my sister was somewhere in Fiji, but where we didn't know. And, and then one morning uh, I went over to see an, another American boat who had a ham radio. And uh, hey Jack, can you call on the, on the net if, if somebody has seen the boat of my sister? And, uh, and at that same moment, my sister or my brother-in-law, he was on the, on the radio looking for us. Yeah, they, they built a uh, Bruce Roberts uh, 37 wood fiberglass boat. And then, so they, they sailed from New Zealand to Fiji. And then after we had contact with the radio, uh, we met them in late in, in Suva in Fiji and cruised around together right. for a month. It was magic. And then eventually to New Zealand. Yeah, so and then we, we sailed down to New Zealand. At that time there was an advertisement for a yacht race from Auckland, New Zealand to Fukuoka, Japan. But we heard about the race and we decided, well, uh, let's, let's join and then uh, uh, we, we signed up for the yacht race. There was a lot of response, but all the boats that um, got the qualifications to, to join the race uh, were able to, to, to join. Yeah. Yeah. And was there a financial incentive? Um, so yeah, so this was sponsored by um, mostly by Yamaha, right? And um, um, so we, we were financially rewarded to right to take part in the race. But the only reason, uh, the only um, rule was that we had to arrive within a certain time frame here in Fukuoka, right? Which we we did, right? So and there were th how many legs to the race? So there was. There were two groups of boats. So there right. was the real race boats division and, a, and there was a cruising division. Oh, okay. And we were, in the, of course, in the cruising division. Yeah. And, um, but we were, we, um, uh, there were three legs from Auckland, New Zealand to F Suva in Fiji. And then the, all the boats started again together right. from Suva to Guam. Right. And then from Guam to Fukuoka, so okay. there were three legs. And what was the period of time spent at each of those? Uh, we just made it. We, all, yeah. we we made it in within the time frame. Okay. So we finished just on time in in Suva and just on time in Guam and just on time in Fukuoka. But then, how uh, much time did you have in Suva after you just made it? Uh, so in Suva, we had something like three days. Oh, okay, wow. So which was long. a bit stressful yeah. because we had. We, we had broken the boom and we had to repair right. the boom, um, which we managed to fix. And then in Guam, we had another uh, layover about three or four days right. before the start again. Okay. Uh, and then we, well, in Fuka, and then we were second. Yeah, second. Last. Second last. <laughs> <laughs> and we arrived in 89 and um, um, with the idea of cruising around Japan for a while. Um, uh, to go up to Alaska and Canada, right? Um, but soon my wife got offered a job at an English school uh, to teach English, right? And so we stayed here for two years, and then we decided to sail back to New Zealand, right? So we left Fukuoka in uh, uh, October '91, and we arrived in New Zealand in. December 92. Right, okay. Uh, via uh, Okinawa, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, um, Vanuatu, down to New Zealand. And then we lived in New Zealand for another two years. I got a job again in the hospital. Um, and then <laughs> we want to go cruising again. And <laughs> somehow the boat sail back to Japan the second time. We still live on the boat. We don't want to move out of the boat. We still live on the boat. Um, although we don't move the boat around uh, yeah. anymore, but uh, I get my ocean and the sea fix from being a crew member on the fishing boat. Right. Um, I do deliveries right. um, from through a company in Fukuoka, I do deliveries. Um, and we have our hobbies here in Marijke is quite active in bird watching and recording all the sightings she's doing and uh, I'm a, a promoter of camping car. Yeah. 
traveling Japan around camping cars and uh, uh, the mountains, hiking. So uh, we enjoy life, it's, it's good. Top tips, crossing an ocean is easy. Mm. It's easy. It's just continue, yeah. as it's just easy. Coastal cruising is tricky because okay. of the currents, the tides, shipping, uh, more likely to run into uh, rubbish. Uh, coastal cruising is uh, more tricky. So one of the tips is if you want to build experience, do overnight trips. Mm. Overnight trips, staying awake, um, doing navigation. Um, it's more tricky to see other vessels. Right. Uh, and if you arrive the next morning in a in the port, then it really gives yeah. satisfaction. So right. good. It's a good point. I mean, that's what yeah. we did in the yeah. beginning. I mean, we on 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 our second trip on Jan Haring to England. Uh, so we, the first trip we had a crew member on board uh, who had a little bit more experience than we did. But uh, the second trip to England and northern part of France, we were just the two of us. We only did overnight trips. Right. Uh, with the idea of in the daytime we have a party time in the harbor, but no, 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 right. <laughs> that was sleep, sleep, sleep. But uh, tip number three, mm. tidy up, tidy up. Always be prepared for something that might happen. Don't leave the dishes. Right. Tidy up as much as possible. Uh, don't leave things flying around in the cockpit. Right. And the, the cruising in, in, the, in the northern part of Europe, even in summer, at nighttime, it's cold. And we had a survival suits. Uh, we were living in our survival suits, uh, which is just like ski wear, but a little bit more waterproof. Um, and we were living in those because when you're cold, you get more likely uh, become seasick. So uh, um, be prepared for yeah what what can happen. Yeah. Um, also know your system by anchoring. Right. Uh, very important. Good anchor. Right. Uh, Any <laughs> other tips? Um, crossing an ocean, you do the magic magic three. So you're Eating, sleeping, and reading. Okay, the magic so three. three yeah. so, and we ah, so the two of us we did um, uh, watches, nighttime watches. Right. Uh, watches we do two hours, two hours on, two hours off, because the person who is on watch two hours is good for concentration, but after that you become more sleepy. Yeah. And then you might make a mistake. So we did two hours on and two hours off. And never is the person who is on watch allowed to leave the cockpit without the other person being out on deck as well. Right. Or at least sit in the, in the entrance. That was a, it's a solid rule because it's, it's, it's bad if you fall overboard, but for the person that stays behind is worse. To come mm -hmm. on the deck and the other one is not there and uh, we over the years we uh, we had heard silly stories like this oh, uh, yes so I'm a solo sailor yeah um, always clip on always clip on always clip on right uh, but the silly than sorry, you know, I always clip on. Well, I hope you enjoyed that with Yap talking about his Americans' adventures at sea. Truly a life at sea. They still live aboard when they're on land or in a camper van. So they're actually living in tiny spaces all their lives. A great couple. Um, do check out the Never Too Late Academy. Uh, kind of a derivative of Pacific Solo. And I'll let you know closer to the time when the History Channel pilot is uh, showing. So... Remember, it's never too late.